Matthew chapter number 5 is where we're at. Our text this morning is really verses number 14 to 16, but the first part of this chapter is the Beatitudes. And it is a good thing to be reminded of these on a regular basis. And it very, may very well be that the truth that God wants for you in this message will just be right here. That He will speak to you from these early verses that we won't even handle, but the Lord has a message for you right there, just in the reading of His Word. And so make sure that as we read, your heart is saying, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Matthew chapter number 5. And seeing the multitudes... He went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Title of this morning's message, Let Your Light So Shine. Let your light so shine. Let's pray. Father, we come to you knowing that we don't know how deeply we need you. We come knowing that you can meet every need in our heart, every need in this room, completely with no difficulty. And we ask, Father, that that's what you would do. That you would look into each heart, see what lies there, the needs that each heart has, and fill each need with yourself this morning. Father, we understand that this work is well beyond us, but we put ourselves in your capable hands and rejoice in a Father who cares so deeply of his children. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ who purchased these things for us. Amen. If I stumble over my words this morning, I do apologize. My mind is extremely tired. But early this week in my devotions, I was reading this passage of Scripture. And the phrase jumped out at me, let your light so shine. It grabbed my attention. But specifically the word so in that phrase, let your light so shine. And the fra- that phrase, let your light so shine before men, will be our goal this morning. That's where we're, our objective is headed for. But in order to get there, we have to lay the foundation so we know what we're doing and what we're talking about. So let's lay down some foundational truths that are very quick, solid points here, easy to understand. Number one, God is light. Okay, that's fairly straightforward. God is light. Very often we learn by illustration. Something that we already know 
is t- used to teach us about something that we don't know, something we don't understand. That's what an illustration does. It's something we know and helps us understand something we don't know. Do you know that God was full well knowing that he would use light as an illustration of himself when he created light? He knew he was going to use that God is light. When he created light, he already knew that he was going to use that as an illustration to help us understand him. And God said, let there be light. This one point, God is light, is such a vast topic. If we were trying to lay this whole foundation here, it would take us dozens of messages just to lay the foundation that God is light. And it would take hundreds of hours of our contemplation just to understand that one statement, God is light. But let's just lay it very briefly here. I was reading an old author who was talking about something completely different, but he posed a question. He said, what would a man be like if he was born inside a building that didn't have any windows? And he lived inside that building with no windows till he was an adult. And when he became an adult, somebody opened the door and let him out. And he walks outside for the first time. What would he think about the sun? Would he not be just overwhelmed by this massive ball of fire in the sky? No, none of us, we even paid attention to it this morning. Why? Because since before you even knew you were you, you've seen it. And you grew up all this time knowing it, and by the time you become an adult and can appreciate these things, it's old hat. But if you had never, ever seen the sun, and you walked out and saw this thing, you would be in total awe. God is light and should draw forth from us more wonder and more awe than his illustration of himself. It is a thing of awe. God is light and we should stand in awe of him. It's also a demonstration of his power. You know, you look up the sun, you don't think much about it because it doesn't seem that big. That's because it's 93 million miles away. Do you realize, some mathematician did the math, if you were at the sun, on the surface of the sun, and you were in a vehicle that could travel 500 miles an hour, it would take you a month of travel just to get to the center of the sun? We're not talking about some little ball up there. We're talking about a massive sphere of burning molten gas It is a demonstration. When God said God is light, it is a demonstration of his power. The thing is hot. The core of the sun is so hot, another scientist figured out that if you heated the head of a pin, a needle, if you would heat the head of a needle, the the heat of the inside, the the temperature of the inside of the sun, it would kill everybody within a thousand mile radius. Almost, that would be almost the whole United States, or a good percentage of the United States would die from a needle that, that was heated, the temperature of the sun. We're talking about a very powerful, massive thing. If you decide, hey, okay, we're going to take care of the sun, you know, all the, all the environmental things, and I'm, we all have our own opinions on some of this stuff. But do you realize how much energy the sun is putting out If we decide that we were going to operate the sun ourselves, if we took the gross domestic product, all the money that the United States earns in one year, if you took all that everybody earned in one year for seven million years, and you paid that to the power company to power the sun, they could power it for one second. All the money that we would make in seven million years to power the sun for one second. It is a massive ball of fire. God said, I am light. And when he created light, it was a demonstration of his power. God is light. And that is just one part of the illustration of the sun. And the sun is only one of a septillion stars Many of them, most of them larger than the sun. 
when we think of God as light, awe and wonder and the power that God has should just overwhelm us. But light also denotes truth. It denotes truth. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God is absolute truth. 1 John 1, 5. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. I trust that nobody in here intentionally lies. I trust that all of you in here are intentionally tell the truth all of the time. But do you ever accidentally lie? This bo- it does bother me, by the way, it does. But I accidentally lie. Numbers don't stick in my head. Calculating numbers, I can do. Do you remember when gas was, you got four cents off when you paid cash? You got four cents off on a gallon of gas? I used to stand there and fill up my tank, and I would do the math in my head while the machine was running and calculate it so that the four cents was being taken off as it was running into the pump so that when I got it all done, it was an even number. It was, I could just pay the guy, and there was no change back. Do you know what I'm talking about? There were several people who did that, told me they would do it too, and you just fill it up, and you're doing the math in your head. To let that, and when it gets to where the number, the, it's, it's an algebraic equation, and you do that. And you go in there, and you put your money down, and the guy, he does all this math, and he looks at you like, are you a genius? Are you, what, how, how did you do this? It's not that difficult. But do you know what? An hour later, if he'd asked me how much gas was per gallon, I couldn't have told you. I can't tell you how much gas is per gallon right now. Because numbers don't stay in my head. And so very often, I'll tell somebody something, and later on, I'll think, wait a second, that isn't even true. I I was at the, the place the other day, talking to a guy, and I said, I live 45 minutes from here. And when I got out in my car, I was driving home, I was thinking, no, wait a second, I only live 20, miles from, or 20 minutes from here. I did not intentionally lie. Do you understand that? But the words came out of my mouth that were untrue. We all do this, not on purpose, it just happens. But do you know this never happens with God? In Him is no darkness at all. He never misspeaks. He never forgets. He never misstates. It's always absolute truth. He is the definition of truth. His facts never get twisted. He never, ever makes a mistake. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. In fact, in heaven, according to Revelation 21 and 22, there is no need of a sun. For God is light. John Rhodes mentioned this in Sunday school. It's been maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. He said, there are no shadows in heaven. I have contemplated that many times since then. Think about what that means. There are no shadows in heaven. There's no place that's got a little less light than any other place. Because God is the light there. And... If you get your mind to running on that, that there's some real thinking to be had there. There are no shadows in heaven. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Everything is perfectly illuminated. Now, so much more could be said about this. We should spend a dozen or two dozen messages just on this one fact. We've laid the foundation. God is light. Point number one. Point number two. The world is dark. The world is dark. Darkness is the absence of light. And the world has no light of its own. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The inverse of that is also true. The world is dark and in it is no light at all. It has no light of its own. We have a very warped view of darkness because we rarely actually experience total darkness. When I was a youth pastor, the teenagers used to go on an annual trip to the caves at Makokoda. <laughs> the new youth pastor says, he went with us one time, didn't you? Didn't you go with us one time? 
No, that was Todd Dorn that went and got stuck. And Tim went one time, I think. Tim's here. Is Tim here? I thought Tim was here. He went and got, almost got stuck too. They didn't go any more than that. It's, if you've ever seen people in caves on, a, on the television, that's not the kind of thing we're talking. It's not like walking through a hallway. When we're talking about going to the caves at Makokata, if you can think about taking all the pots and pans out of your kitchen cabinets and then crawling in and out of them, that's a lot closer to the, the spelunking that's done at Makokata. But I used to take the kids there. In fact, there was one place where you actually have to, it must be 300 feet down, 400 feet down, something like that, into the ground. And there's one place where you actually have to lay on your belly, put your flashlight in front of you, and crawl like this through the water. And it's so tight that you have to lay like that or else you can't get out or you can't get through. And then it opens up on the other side. Anyway, in, if you've ever seen caves in the movies... You haven't seen real caves. Because in the movies, do you know what a cave actually looks like in the movies? If it were for real? It would be a black screen with voices talking. Because there are no lights in caves. You see these movies where these guys get trapped in a cave. And there's just a little faint light. There is no light. When you, took, you turn off your flashlight in a cave, you can stick your finger in your eye and never see it. That's what it's like. It's total, complete darkness. We have a difficulty with darkness because we never actually see total darkness. My friend, this is the world. It has no light of its own. It has no truth of its own. The God of this world, the wicked devil, is the father of lies, John 8, He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. He speak, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The world is dark, and it has no light of its own. Now, this is not just truth in a vacuum. It's not just a statement that we make. It actually has meaning. You know, when we deal with the world today, and everybody here has been scratching your head, it's like, what is the world is going on? What is wrong with these people? Everybody here, if you've paid any attention at all, what's going on? We ought to keep two things in mind. The world has always been dark. Since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, the world has been dark and has had no light of its own. We watch the news and we see what's happening. We think, boy, the world is getting darker. I'm sorry, but it can't happen. The world has always been totally devoid of light. It can't get any darker. Many times in history has this been displayed. In Noah's day, every thought of man was only evil continually. The world has always been dark. Keep that in mind when you watch the news. The world has always been dark. Second thing you ought to keep in mind, you cannot expect the world to walk in light. You cannot expect the world to walk in light. To walk in light. Over and over in recent days, we've scratched our heads and said, How can these people be so stupid? It's not stupidity, it's blindness. They don't have any light. We were in Makokata one time. We were 300 feet down in the biggest cave there, the longest cave there. We just crawled through the water on our bellies. Or on the opening on the other side. And we heard a noise. And we shine our flashlight there. And there are two teenagers sitting on the other side of that spot. Must be 300 feet down in the earth. And they don't have any flashlights. They have wandered down into this cave without light. And in this particular cave, there it... There are fissures in this particular spot where if you stepped in it, you would break your leg. There were a 
a, a thousand, maybe a hundred thousand places to bump your head and knock yourself unconscious. And there's actually a Y in the thing, so you could easily take the wrong turn and get so confused in there without light. And you're thinking, that's crazy. But you know, this is what the world is. They don't have any light. They were born in darkness, and they live in darkness, and they have no light. They are totally blind. And when you watch the news, realize these people, it's not that they're stupid, it's that they are blind. Without light, you go the wrong way, you make dumb moves, and you get yourself hurt. And that's what's happening in our world today. People operating without light. Somebody asked Brother Lawrence, who's an old writer, about the evil in the world. And this has been a long time ago, hundreds of years ago. And he said, this is classic, I'll, I'll paraphrase him slightly, but he did say this for sure. The world will always be worldly. The world will always be worldly. And then he went on to say, I, ne- I am never surprised by the evil that men do. In fact, I know the heart of man, and I am always shocked that he doesn't do worse, that something holds him back from doing what he actually would do if he was given the chance. The world will always be worldly. The world has no light of its own. And if they had light, many of them would not use it. John chapter number 3, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Even if man had light, he wouldn't come to it if he had a choice. Why? Because his deeds would be reproved. In 1992... Carol and I need another car. That's a whole other story. I won't tell you the whole story about that some other time. But I bought this car. I needed to paint it. It was, it was wrecked. I needed to paint it. So I had to do some body work on the thing. So I bought the tools to do that, which is a DA sander. DA stands for dual action. A DA sander, and I needed some sandpaper. And so I talked to the guys at the body shop what kind of sandpaper I needed. They sold me the stuff, and so away I went. Went to work on the car. Sanded the whole car down to get it ready to paint. We took it down to it. My brother, had, Steve, had a, was renting a spot down there on the other side of Knoxville so we could paint it in his garage or in that shop that he had there. So Dad came and sprayed the car. And inside that garage, it wasn't a ton of light. You need a lot of light when you're spraying a vehicle. Uh, there wasn't a ton of light in there, but enough to spray with. And inside that garage, that car looked amazing. And after the paint dried, we pulled all the paper off and backed that car out of that garage. And I wanted to die right there on the spot. Because DA means dual action. What I didn't realize is there is a little lever on that that takes it from single action to dual action. Dual action means it circles, but it also orbits. So it doesn't just grind, it orbits, okay? And it does one of these things, okay? I had it on single action, which just goes like this. And the sandpaper that the guy had told me to use was about twice as rough as what it should have been. And I don't know if you know anything about cars, but when you're sanding a car, some of the stuff is almost like polishing with silk, okay? Well, this had some grit to it. And so when I had DA'd this whole car, I actually single actioned this whole car, I put scratches. No, it wasn't just one bad fender. It was one bad car. (laughs) And if you were closer than 15 feet, you had to do a double take. Like, what is wrong with that vehicle? It looked so bad. It was perfect for a guy who worked the night shift. (laughs) That's all I got to say. I was embarrassed of the car. Why? (laughs) Men love darkness rather than light because their DA wasn't working properly. This is exactly why men don't come to the light. Because when they come out into the light of God's truths, all of the blemishes start to show up, and it's embarrassing 
Who would want to see that? So they hide in the darkness to make it so that they still look pretty good. When you're looking at the world today, realize that they don't have any light. And if they did have light, they wouldn't want to come into it because their deeds would be reproved if they did. God is light to the world is dark. They do not have any light of their own. Number three, light was manifest to the world. Light was manifest to the world. You realize God could have just left the world in darkness? After the Garden of Eden, God could have just said, you know what, tired of that, forget it. But because of his great love, He sent light into the world. The light was sung about by Zacharias in Luke 179 to give light to them that sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. It was preached of by the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter number 26 to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sin. In that classic passage in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear a witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. God could have left us in darkness, but light was manifest in the world. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. God is light. The world is dark. Light was manifest. Number four, We have His light. We have His light. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, Christ came to live within you. And now, according to our passage, Matthew chapter number 5, ye are the light of the world. You have His light. Now, if you followed me this far, God is light, the world is dark, life was manifest, we have his light. If you follow this far, we come to a very uncomfortable question. God is light and the world is dark and light was manifest and now we have his light. The very uncomfortable question is this. If... The world is getting darker around us. Who is to blame? Now look at the foundation. It's a very uncomfortable question. Who is to blame if things are getting darker around us? Those who have no light? Or those who have his light? Is that not a very uncomfortable question? Who is to blame if the light is getting, if it's getting darker around us? You know, we yell about the darkness that seems to be taking over the world. But let me ask you, what light have they seen? Can you honestly say, I have shown so brightly the Lord Jesus that people have been running from it. Because my light from the Lord has been so bright that men love darkness rather than light. And so they run from it because my light for him of the Lord has been so bright they've had to run from it. And so it's getting dark because they're running from the light that I have shown them. 
If I asked anybody to stand up who would say that, I don't think we'd have too many people standing up saying, my light has been so bright that people have run. We're not talking about telling people how stupid they are. We're not talking about flexing our political muscle. We let our light shine because we flex our political muscle. We're not talking about boycotts or demonstrations. We're not talking about how many times did you post on Facebook or how many times did you share the latest in-your-face meme, that social meme that comes up, these little pictures, and you share this thing and that's sharing your light. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about the church in general. We're not talking about this church specifically. We're talking about you as you sit there in your pew this morning, in your seat, Where have you shown the true light and light of Jesus Christ in this totally dark world? And that is a very uncomfortable question. Because you can yell at the television set all day long. You can scream at how stupid the fake news is. You can rail against the protesters. But when you look in the mirror and say, where have I let light shine into this world? To what person have I actually done that? It gets very, very uncomfortable. Where have you shown the true light and life of Jesus Christ in this totally dark world? Is your light hid under a five-gallon bucket? Is it so covered by the things of this life that only, the only person who benefits from the light within is you? Because the, world of, the, the things of this world have so covered your light under your five-gallon bucket? A city, the passage says, that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You know, down in a valley, a light shining in a dwelling at night may not be seen. But if you put that light up on the top of a hill, it's going to be seen. Even a small light on the top of a hill can be seen from a very long distance. You now I'm sitting there thinking about this passage. Who, want, who needs to see a light at night? Who cares to see a light and try to discover a city at night? There's actually only, I came up with two real answers to this. A person who is lost out in the wilderness or out in no, the middle of nowhere wants to see a light. Think if you were out in the middle of the desert and you saw a light of a city. What a rejoicing that would be. <clears throat> I don't know how many people in the world have been saved in a blizzard because of some light in a farmhouse window. So people who are lost, who are searching for their way, are looking for a light. The other person that I came up with that would want to look for a light and find a city at night is an enemy that wants to attack. If you've seen anything from World War II, you know that they had blackouts all over the country. And at night, they had civil civil defense. That's right, civil defense. People who walk around the town to make sure that there were no lights shining at all so that airplanes that they would be flying over could find the city to bomb by anybody showing any light. So you have two kind of people who are looking for a city on a hill, that light to shine. One, someone who needs help. And two, someone who wants to attack. You know, I sat in my chair, and this is another uncomfortable thought. Are we so afraid of being attacked that we hide the light so that the people who really would come to the light never see it? And just wander in darkness. We're so afraid of the persecution that might come that we hide that light and the people who would come to Christ who are searching for light go on wandering because we have hid our light from the lost. God is light. The world is dark. The light was manifest. We have his light. Number five, let that light so shine. Let's look carefully at verse number 16 and we're done here. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You have this light. You know what? You can let this light shine on you. This is so common in Christian circles, it does not even need to be mentioned. We take the light of the Lord and shine it on ourselves so that we can shine. Pride and self almost rule Christian circles. We're letting the light of the gospel shine right on us so that we can be illuminated. It's kind of like when you're working with a kid and they're holding the light. I don't know if you ever did this with your kids. You're trying to work and they're holding the light. And you look over and you can't see anything. And you look over and they're looking in the light or putting it under their chin. Do you ever do that as a kid? Put it under your chin and make you look really creepy. So that's what they're doing with the light. They're letting it shine on them. And you know what? It's, that light is wasted because it's supposed to be doing and it's not. It's being shown on the kid. The light is being wasted. So much of the light that has been put within us is wasted because let our light so shine on us and the light is wasted. The other thing we shine our light on is our work. This is what we're doing for the Lord, so let me put the focus on my work for the Lord. This is so common in Christian circles that not even need to be mentioned either. See what I did for the Lord, and we let our light shine on the work. This is the equivalent of your child helping you, but he's got his project there, and your project's over here, and you're supposed to be doing this project, but he's got it over there, so looking at whatever he wants to look at. This light is also wasted. The passage is very specific of where this light is to shine. And what the outcome is supposed to be. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How do you shine a light so that people will see your work and glorify your Father? How does that work? How do you let the light so shine that you will see, they see your work and glorify God? You know, it's really not very difficult when you actually think about it. It happens all the time. Have you ever gone to a junior high science fair? Anybody here ever gone to a junior, junior high science The crowd's all dead. Nobody even knows if they're alive today. <laughs> you don't know if you're even here today, not much less a junior high science fair. Junior high science fairs. When I first became youth pastor here, there was a couple of kids who they went to Southeast Pogue and they wanted to do the junior high science fair. And so I told them I would help them. So the one kid, his name was Jamie. We built, Dad had built a vertigo chair, which is a chair that you spin that, shoot, that teaches pilots. You remember Dad and his vertigo chair that he used in church one time? It teaches pilots to not trust their instincts, but to trust the instrument. And so you, you, fool, you fool yourself, you put them in the chair, you blindfold them and so forth, and when you spin it, if you slow it down, they actually think they're going the other way. It's really an interesting thing to watch. It's called a vertigo chair. Anyway, so he wanted to do that for his project, and so we worked on that. He actually ended up winning state. He, won, he got second to Southeast Polk. He won state, and then he went to Simpson College and got special recognition from NASA and all this kind of stuff on his project. The other kid was like car engines and that kind of thing. They were both 7th graders or 8th graders. So we built a display on how a carburetor works. Now, both of these displays were very interesting, very well done, but the people would come up to the kid, especially with the one with the carburetor, and to listen to him try to explain how the carburetor worked was embarrassing. <laughs> Because he had no clue how a carburetor worked. It was a very interesting display. It was very well done. It was cool. But he had no clue about any of this. Now, if you've ever been to a junior high science fair project, fair, you go to the thing. There was a girl there at the, with the first we were at. She had six jars. And she had different juices in each jar, pop and orange juice and water and so forth. And her premise was, which one of these is good for you? And she had taken a string and hung a nail in there. She had her thinking backwards. But anyway, she'd hung a nail in each one. And whichever one rusted the most, 
was the worst for you. And so actually Coca-Cola, I think, ended up being the best for you. <laughs> and I think water caused it to rust the most. So <laughs> anyway, that was her research. And see, <laughs> you see this thing laid out like that. You pat them on the back and say, thanks for entering. <laughs> okay. You go to the next one. It's a, it's a piece of poster board. Some of the words are misspelled. You know, it's kind of it got two bucks to buy the whole shebang. And you say, nice job. You go to the next one, and this thing looks like it came out of a factory showroom. Got electronics. Everything is in big, bold letters. Everything is really well done. You got a $900 project here. Now, when you pat the kid on the back and say, nice project, who are you really thinking about? You say, man, your dad knows how to build a project. Because there's no seventh grader in the world who could ever do that. Do you understand? You see the good work and you glorify the Father. This is exactly how this works. When people look at you and see your life and say, <laughs> you didn't do that. That's neat. but Your life's neat, but you didn't do that. That's Letting your light shine. Let's put it a different way. Do you live a supernatural blessed life? Can your next door neighbor explain your life? Do your actions, do your attitudes, does your finances, does your decision making... Do your tragedies, all of those things, do they look just like theirs does? Or do they look at your life and say, how does that work? How does your life operate? And they realize you're not smart enough to do that. You're not powerful enough to do that. And they see there's something else at work here. That's letting your light shine. When you live that supernatural blessed life that God has given you, and they see your life and say, you must have some kind of a father. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. God is light. The world is dark. Light was manifest. We have his life. And we are to let that light so shine that God gets the glory. Let your light so shine. Let's pray.